My name's David Patterson. Uh, good to see you all. I'm based here at Offby Hillsborough, looking after grassland research. There, there's two things I want to try and cover with you today uh, as quickly as possible. Number one is centered in around these short, medium and long term changes to grass growth for Northern Ireland on this side and then some of the potential steps or maybe solutions that you could try and put into practice at farm level on this side. There's a number of challenges that are facing our, our grass-based farming systems that you probably know all about, but you know, I'm talking about the financial pressures with feed and fertilizer price fluctuations and, 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 and product price. There's environmental pressures with reducing carbon footprint, reducing uh, emissions and all of that. And you'll hear lots more about that in other talks today. And then what I want to try and focus on a bit more is short, medium and long term, term weather fluctuations and longer term climate change. There's an awful lot of talk in the press and the farming press about climate change and the impact of it. What we're trying to do today is put some numbers onto that that mean something and give you opportunities to try and make your farm a bit more resilient to longer term climate change. So to begin with, we'll look at one year and that's 2023. Hopefully you can all see the graph or bits of it. Um, what we have on the green line is the actual recorded grass growth taken from cut plots here at Hillsborough and at Caffrey. As well as that, we have about 50 satellite farm sites farmers who, who measure grass and, and send us in the data week by week. And we put all, that, put all that data together and produce graphs like this. The point is 2023 was topsy-turvy as you know. There was a period of below average growth there in May and June and then there was another period of below average growth basically for the rest of the summer um, from July onwards but for, for two wildly different reasons. That May-June period it was hot, but like today, it was hot and dry. But we had about five weeks of this, if you remember back, at least in the eastern part of the province. And then from about July onwards, we had cool, very wet conditions. And those very wet periods of weather seemed to just continue right the way through to about mid-April of this, of this year. So it's just illustrating the fact that we're getting more and more of these erratic weather patterns and 23 is not on its own. We've looked back over almost 25 years of grass check data, looked at the weather fluctuations. We're, we seem to be getting more and more of those erratic years. So what we did then was looked at the data a bit more closely. We separated into the first 10 years and the second 10 years. Now 20 years in total is still a drop in the ocean when it comes to climate change. And we know that. But what we noticed in the first decade versus second decade of grass check results, it's starting to increase in terms of total amount of production and becoming a bit more variable. And that's based on actual hard data, okay? Now, if you've seen grass check reported in the press or online, you'll see the weekly bulletin has a seven day prediction of grass growth and a 14 day prediction. And we get that by applying, uh, we have this model, it's the AFB Graze Grow model. We punch in the forecasted weather data from the Met Office, and then we can model out what it's going to do over the next couple of weeks. And that's what you see in the press. So we thought we would use that same model, layer in on top of that the UK climate change weather pattern prediction scenarios, and there's 15 of those for every year from now until the end of the century. Okay, so bolted the two things together and the outcome of that was this graph. So if you don't look at any other graph, please look at this one today. This shows the annual production of grass, the annual yield of grass in Northern Ireland. First of all, we pointed the model backwards through the whole way back to 1900. And then we ran it again, pointed it forwards, and projected out to 2100. So this is annual yield for Northern Ireland. And what you can see here, hopefully, is over the first period up to the early 2000s, it's reasonably flat. You know, things didn't change so much. 
And at a smaller level, that's what we saw in our actual grass check data, going from big scale to small scale there. But this is the more concerning thing here. This is actually good news. There's more grass growth predicted for the future. With climate change, every, uh, every one degree C of uh, long-term climate change will basically result in more grass production, okay? But no one, have, no one has ever actually put numbers on this. So you're seeing this for the first time today. What's slightly more concerning about it is these upper and lower limits, the brownie lines are the upper and lower limits up and down from the average. They're starting to get slightly further apart as we move towards the end of the century. So that was a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a red light flashing there on that one. What we did then was break it down into individual months. Most of that extra two tons of dry matter production that we're talking about seems to be occurring at either end of the, of the growing season. There was more production forecasted or modelled um, in, in April and then again in the back end of the season, October, November. Okay, so it seems like the shoulders of the season will lift a bit. The bigger problem is what's going to happen in the middle part of the summer. June, July and August, because the, the June, July and August all looked like this graph, okay? So the grass, the predicted monthly grass growth using the model is fairly flat. I would call that flat. Um, but this is the big problem here. The volatility, the variability, the topsy-turvy nature of the grass supply curve will become increasingly variable, even through what you might call your core summer months. And that's a massive challenge. Look at yesterday and today. Yesterday it was probably somewhere between zero and five kilograms of growth at best. Today it's probably back up to about 50, 50 to 55, I would say. Anyway, so that's the problem. We're going to get more growth, but it's going to be more variable, especially in the middle part of the summer. So what on earth can we do? What I've tried to identify here is um, short term, medium term, and some longer term steps that you could take to try and improve the resilience of our grass-based systems to help ride out some of the variability that we're talking about up here. <clears throat> so first of all, it's, it's, it's back to basics. It's all of your good, sound grassland management practices. It's measuring swards, it's budgeting grass, looking at entry and exit height covers, all of that. And you, you've heard about this for years, but it works. And if you plot out, this is just um, uh, a set of measurements over uh, uh, a farm of paddocks on one day. So you've got your, your paddock that you're about to graze and the paddock that you've just grazed and everything else in between. And you try and manage that wedge. That wedge will change shape depending on the demand of your, your flock or your, or your group of cattle or whatever it may be. So you can help to try and write out some of the day-by-day -day fluctuations, week-by-week, month-by-month, see, uh, seasonal changes by doing good sound grassland management. Our own, our own grass check farmers have shown that with the numbers that they supply to us. Um, not only able to grow more grass by doing all of this grass budgeting technique, um, grow more grass but utilize more as well. And there's more profitability in it for them also. The next step, these next two steps here, what I would call medium term steps that you could adopt on your farm to try and make it more resilient. First of all, in terms of incorporating the benefits of legumes, we're talking red clover for silage swords, white clover for grazing swords. And there's, there's a bit of a, 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 a fuzzy area in between those two. But just to illustrate that, we said that the, the grass check plots are perennial ryegrass only, with the highest possible rate of chemical fertilizer, 270, okay? Last year, when we put those alongside our grass clover plots with no nitrogen, you can see the growth rate there of grass and the growth rate of the grass clover. That's only one year. And these were second year swards, so and it was a unique set of conditions, weather conditions that we had in 2023. But that's the actual raw numbers. Much more productivity. And even we only had the, the plots properly measured and recorded from June onwards. Even in that period there, the difference there was just over 
two tons of dry matter per hectare with zero nitrogen. Okay. This year we've only had some results in the spring so far. We've got 2024 results sitting alongside and you can see already that the clover growth rate was below the grass with fertilizer. And we've had a horrible spring, cold and wet and late. We seem to, April just disappeared off the calendar, it didn't count. Um, but this is maybe one of the downsides of clover. It's got a lower temperature threshold for growth, especially in the springtime. You notice it more in the spring. Time up. Um, it's, it's got a temperature threshold, for, uh, it needs 8 degrees C, whereas grasses, most of them need 5.5 to 6 degrees C. So obviously they will grow maybe a week or two weeks earlier, and that explains this. So we'll have to think of practical ways of dealing with that. That might be having a, a, a greater reserve of silage available for that period, or putting a small amount of nitrogen fertilizer on in the spring only. Every fertilizer pellet you put on, you're decreasing the nitrogen fixation, decreasing the benefit you get later on in the summer. The next step, and there's lots of production benefits from putting the grass clover in, the next step is to add in other species. I'm talking about other grasses here, never mind herbs, okay? So you could think about putting in other species such as Festulolium, which is like ryegrass with deep roots. Timothy, earlier to grow in, 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 in a cold, wet spring than perennial ryegrass. So there's other options there. The main effect that I'm talking about is adding in clovers and herbs in that middle part of the season. That's when they peak. We're standing here late-ish part of June. They will peak July, August, September. When perennial ryegrass takes a dip midsummer, they are thriving. So it helps to flatten out the whole herbage supply right through the summer months. There's benefits there. We had two years of grazing uh, first year calves, a bit like what's standing behind you. Um, first year cattle had higher live weight gain on the multi-species spores two years in a row. And we also found benefits below the surface. They were deeper rooting. You had more worms in, the, in, in the, the upper horizons of the soil, which meant the soil structure was better and more free draining as well. So there's lots of good soil health type benefits there. Last but not least is adding trees into grassland to make a farm system more resilient. You can see behind you mature woodland. There are strategic willow over there for biofiltration and there's young agroforestry sitting over there. Agroforestry would actually be a lot less dense than that planting up there, but it gives you the idea. So one positive feature from, from 23 years of agroforestry research at AFB Log Gall, they looked at the trafficability of the soil in a field where you've put trees in amongst the grass, or it's the other way around. 40% is when 40% soil moisture content above 40%, the soil is too wet to walk on. Never mind graze or take, take vehicular traffic across it. So what we found was what they reported was that for the, the purple line is the agroforestry field. It basically had an extra 17 weeks through that off season, which is autumn through to the following spring. 17 extra weeks when you could drive across or graze the field because it was more trafficable, because it was better drained. Just natural drainage from deeper roots. So that's just one practical aspect. It could be like your go-to field, even in a wet summer, to have one or two fields of that so that you could actually keep on grazing, keep stock outside, as opposed to having to bring them in. Extra 17 weeks of, of grazing um, and extra benefits in terms of carbon. The carbon in the wood and the carbon sequestration beneath the surface. I will stop there because I've already had several signals to, to, uh, to finish. So lots more, more growth, more variability in the future. Just think about ways and means that you could start to make your grassland farm that bit more resilient.